Finally, let us uh, examine uh, how the state and the political system uh, were set up uh, after 1989 in uh, Romania. Now, uh, <clears throat> just like the revolutions, the tr uh, changes in 1989, the events of 1989 happened very differently uh, in uh, Poland, Czechoslovakia, uh, Hungary from Romania. Just the same, what happens afterwards uh, is different. And we will look at this more closely in the next section, but um, the, the key aspects need to be, uh, are worth mentioning because obviously they will shape also the state and the political system. So you have a gradual transition, uh, a negotiated transition, mostly by opposition elites versus reformist communists in Poland, Czechoslovakia and Hungary, but as we've seen in Romania, you do not have that. And mostly you do not have that because it was a totalitarian state with a very strong grip on uh, society. There was no opposition civil society that was built. Remember our discussion about that? Uh, what does it mean to, to create dissidents, to create opposition in a totalitarian or authoritarian system? Uh, and the fact that there were no organized networks, groups and leaders of opposition. There were some individual dissidents, uh, some sporadic ad hoc uh, movements of opposition, but not any organized networks who could then speak for the against the regime. And there was no negotiated transition. It was an explosion um, uh, that uh, was uh, uh, the clash between basically the ruling el uh, elite of Ceausescu and the, the, really the grassroots of the population. Right? As, I, as we talked about this, that's the revolution. right? But immediately <laughs> what happens is that, well, there's a power vacuum. And because there was no organized network of, uh, of opposition who was who would have been prepared intellectually, um, organizationally. Right? You have to be prepared, you have to have the knowledge, you have to have thought and discussed about what next. Well, all of that happens in the other countries, but not, not in Romania, because there has not been uh, such, a, uh, such a movement. Uh, there could not have been, or you know, there has not been. So, the only organized group that is ready to enter into this uh, void of power and, and, and install itself are basically second, third ranking uh, sort of communists, basically the reformist communists, and not so much reformed. <laughs> but those who in the other countries are actually removed from power, uh, uh, and although being the partners of discussion with the opposition groups, right, the reformist communists in Hungary, Poland, Poland Czechoslovakia, they become partners in the roundtable discussions, but they're removed from power. In Romania, they take power. They take power, and this is what will become, a, uh, you know, kind of. Central Eastern Europe will have this three kind of groups of uh, of countries: those who will quickly move on the path of reform, and they, you know, the, the major examples there will be Poland, uh, Czech Republic, uh, Hungary. Then uh, Romania and Bulgaria, which kind of similarly will have a, a very a delayed transition. Mostly because those who will go in, go in power, come to power after 1989, will actually be uh, a for, former communist, uh, not so reformed, <laughs> not so reformed. Uh, and uh, and the third group, which is Yugoslav, which is a whole different case, right? Um, because of the war there. So that these are the three types of transitions, right? And and even and and later, you know, uh, they will. Uh, things will develop in, in various ways. But up to, let's say, mid-2000s, right, between 1989 and mid-2000s, that's kind of the, the, the path. There's the central group that I mentioned, then there's Romania and Bulgaria, which are kind of more backward economically, uh, and also politically in terms of, so all the transition is, is delayed, slower, uh, more problematic, and, and the countries of former Yugoslavia. Within the countries of former Yugoslavia, after the war, but we're not going to talk about this now, uh, also, separate groups of countries will, will, will separate. And not by chance, you'll see, uh, this, this division of uh, the types of transitions that they will undergo under, after the fall of Yugoslavia, so af after the end of the 1990s, will kind of be mirrored, it will kind of mirror, will kind of reflect uh, the division between the westward-leaning, civilizationally westward-leaning countries, uh, states, uh, newly formed states like Slovenia and Croatia, versus the problem of Bosnia and Herzegovina versus the eastward leaning Serbia, Macedonia, Montenegro. Right? But now you see how it mirrors these 
cultural divisions, these socio-political divisions that we have seen historically, you know, those who have been under the Ottoman Empire, those who haven't, and so on. Now, remember that in Romania, this division falls right in the middle of the country. And when we discuss politics in Romania, we will have to deal with this. We will have to deal with the fact that, that uh, you will have uh, significant cleavages uh, which means uh, socio-cultural, uh, uh, political divisions uh, within this country, which will mirror to a good degree several things, but which will mirror to a good degree what we discussed already in the previous sections, the difference, the socio-political, socio-cultural <coughs> difference between Transylvania versus Moldova and Wallachia. Uh, and by Moldova, I mean that region of Romania, right? Not the Republic of Moldova, which is a different country. So, uh, which so northeast, south versus west, right? But we'll talk about this. But again, this is why we have discussed everything that we have discussed up to this point for you to understand what this is about, because otherwise it makes no sense, right? Uh, so we'll get there. But now let's go back to uh, the fact that in Romania, the uh, what happens immediately during uh, the last days of 1989 revolution and immediately thereafter is basically a takeover of power by second ranking, uh, you know, third ranking, you know, members of the nomenclatura of the of the communist former communist now former communist elite, and there is a transition to democracy, meaning you know things are liberalized, markets, you know, and so on. But it doesn't function as a liberal democracy, it doesn't function as a functioning market because all all this transition is slowed down, and there is a grip on power by people who were, well, some half convinced about how fast they should move in the, on the, on the, in the direction of uh, political, economic, and, and economic uh, reform, of transition to uh, liberal democracy and to the market economy. Okay, and these are the people, right, more authoritarian minded, right, it's still, again, it's a democracy in 1990, but sort of an illiberal democracy, right, remember our definitions, you are you are supposed to know and, and be able to use those expressions. So this is sort of an illiberal democracy uh, in the beginning of the 90s, uh, which is a gradual, then gradually will be uh, worked into a more functioning uh, liberal democracy by 1996 and so on. So, in this illiberal democracy, there's a group that has a hold on power also because they have a hold on the public uh, attention, because these were, remember, the people who appeared on TV during the, last, the, the days of the revolution, the last days of the revolution. And remember that if in the urban uh, areas, the major urban areas, there was an actual popular revolution, in many other smaller, uh, especially in the east part, eastern part of Romania, and especially in the rural areas of those parts, you didn't have an actual revolution. The revolution actually happened by watching what is going on on TV. Okay. So, uh, for a large part of the population who did not have an actual revolution like Tibishara, uh, Turgumuresh, Brasov, uh, Cluj, Bucharest, and other uh, cities, um, where there was an actual revolution, you don't have it in, in, uh, uh, in, in, in many other areas. So for them, this is the revolution. These are, these are the readers, leaders of the revolution. And as your book describes, it very well, your, your books rather, uh, describe it very well. You know, the, the figure that will emerge will be the figure of Ion Iliescu, the, the former party the nomenclatura members who become sort of a father of the revolution. Well, it wasn't, of course, yeah. but he take, he gets to the right place in the right time and he has the skills and the network to, you know, step into this void of power. Now, it's these people who will write, basically, and pass, win the elections in May 1990, and will, which will give them both the presidential and the parliamentary elections, and will give them the tools to shape Romania in the sense of shaping the political system and uh, the state. So they come from a specific background, right? So let's take it one by one, right? So the Romanian state. And here's an interesting thing, right? And remember again the, the four factors that we have to take into account. What there is, historical legacy, examples around from the Western democratic world uh, and uh, um, the, the, the specific political uh, circumstances of the moment. All of these play here. So the state, surprisingly in a way, it will be unitary. And why do I say surprising, right? Well, remember that Romania was formed of different provinces united in 1918. 
So in that sense, it's logical that it's unitary because the very existence of the state. Let me give you an example. The UK is a unitary state, although it's now moving backwards, but it's a unitary state, although it's made of several nations. England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland, they call themselves nations. And yet it's a unitary state, and it has been for the longest time because the very building of the United Kingdom was through a process of taking power from the units and putting them into the center, which is definitely, you know, uh, so is the opposite of federalization, it is creating a unitary uh, state. So that's why it's a unitary state. Well, Romania has, you know, parallels to that because it's very creation of this state called Romania in the 19th century and then in the early 20th century is a process of, you know, uh, taking away power from these units, right, centralizing it. But not just centralizing, creating a state, a unitary state. So you see that, that's one thing, right, why it is unitary, right. Uh, second, but it, it's not, you know, it could be different, right, because there are these, the legacy of throughout history of three different provinces, you know, and among which are significant, significant differences, social, social cultural, uh, and so on, which came around, uh, in, which became evident immediately after the unification in 1918. So that's a one reason. Second reason, there are there is a large population of ethnic minorities, you know, in a uh, population, a total population of about 18 million, probably, uh, uh, right now, uh, 1.6 million or thereabouts, um, over 1 million uh, ethnic Hungarians, right? Obviously in Transylvania, right? Which has its own history, right? Then there was a significant German minority, a Serbian, and this, and it, so a large, uh, many minority ethnic, ethnic groups. So, and the Hungarians are concentrated or the, in, in the center here, and that's the interesting thing. There are, you know, here as well, but mostly in the center. Right? And at a certain point, at the beginning, in the middle, well, up to the middle of the communist period, this was actually an autonomous region. It was an autonomous region. Uh, it had a different status within the state. But Ceausescu, and here's the immediate situation and the immediate past. Remember that Ceausescu's regime was both communist and nationalist. And he had a very strong anti hungarian nationalist rhetoric. Okay? And the, so the accentuation of a nationalistic view of the past and of this idea that the unitary Romania is the accomplished and communist Romania for him was the accomplishment of the history of Romania of course reading backwards because there was no Romania in you know 500 years before uh, but you know kind of reading the history as it uses this typical nation, national nation centered reading nationalistic you know reading of history which it all leads to this right well it, Part of it was to eliminate this autonomous region and to concentrate power in Bucharest and to emphasize that Romania is a unitary state. Furthermore, in the Constitution, it says that uh, Romania is not just a unitary from the first sentence of the Constitution. We look at the Constitution. It says that Romania is a unitary and national state, nation state. Right? That's also, you know, remember the concept of nation state, that the nation corresponds with the state. Well, obviously, factually, this is not true. Right? Because there are different national groups here, uh, defined ethnically, right? as they have been defined, uh, also Romanian national ethnicity is defined ethnically, and you have you know, some Serbians and Germans here and here, and uh, you know, different nationalities. So, it's not saying that Romania is a state of a nation puts these ethnic groups in a difficult situation. Are they part of the, of the state or not? Does the state represent them or not? So you see all this conundrum, and yet the state is unitary, irrespective of the historical differences between the provinces, uh, say Transylvania and Banat and Valachia and uh, well, this is different and Moldova and whatever. Right? So it's an interesting thing, and it is still the cause of, of tensions uh, today. But it is unitary state because of the historical uh, legacy. Because of the immediate historical legacy, a legacy of centralization and communism, a, a, a legacy of the rhetoric of nationalism, a legacy of tension between the Hungarian, ethnic Hungarian, well, not necessarily the population, but in the rhetoric, right, in the uh, between the Hungarian and Romanian nationalism, so to speak. Okay, so that's one issue. Uh, then let's look at the political system. 
Now, here again, think of those four factors. Now, so how do we get, how will we get to where we are? Now, Romina, um, so what was the historical legacy? So it, Romania was never a republic before communism, right? Communism removed the monarchy, right? So you had that, right? And you had pretty strong monarchs um, in the interwar period. Some failures as well, right? So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue. What you will see in the Romanian political system, the way it is set up, is that in many ways, if, for example, in the Hungarian case, the model is Germany, with reference to also its Hungarian history, the model here is France. And because there is a long and uh, significant legacy of Francophilia, of, of French uh, cultural soci uh, orientation towards France in terms of a cultural socio-political uh, model, right? Especially in the, west, in the eastern and southern part of the country, less in the, in the west, which was more obviously Austrian-German oriented because, well, being part, the west was part of Austria-Hungary. So you see already the differences here. But anyway, the French model predominates, those who write the constitution are mostly from the east, eastern part, well, the uh, yeah, central eastern, southern part, uh, they're most, they come from this authoritarian view, uh, as I mentioned, whatever, um, at least the liberal view. So it's a semi-presidential system, right? It's a semi-presidential system. Um, and it fits, or oh, we talk about how it fits or it doesn't. So a semi-presidential system, as we remember, has a president, a prime minister, a cabinet, uh, and it has uh, two houses of the parliament, right? Again, interesting thing. Okay. The semi-presidential system means that the president will be directly elected and will be both head of state with some head of executive, head of government, uh, head of executive uh, uh, roles. And this is the question. This is the problem with the semi-presidential system, just like in Poland, right? Is the balance between this who is directly elected and these who are directly elected. Now, before we go, go there, Let's talk a little bit about the Chamber of Deputies and the Senate. Why bicameral? Now you would say, well, of course bicameral, because the different provinces, or because of the ethnic minorities. Remember, the idea of bicameralism, besides the idea of checks and balances, whatever, um, you know, separating powers, one of ten, right, uh, has, you know, has to be also rooted in the fact that, you know, the legislature represents the state. But the state is constituted of what? In the US, the state is constituted, the United States is a state, is constituted by people and regions, right? which we call states here, but they're regions, right? provinces. This is why the lower house represents the people and the upper house the provinces, right? constitutionally, at least in the constitution and originally. Uh, same in Germany, the upper house represents the land, which are the provinces, lower house, the people. Right? That's, the, that's what makes the state. Yeah? What makes the state here? It's a unitary state, remember. And contrary to what you would assume, the Senate does not represent the provinces. The Senate does not represent the different ethnic groups in the population. The Senate will not represent, as you will see the, is the case in Slovenia, the different categories in the population, professions and guilds, so to speak. It simply represents the same thing. So today, for example, and for the last 10 years, there has been a huge debate and a huge popular uh, anger, actually, but the fact that the parliament is bicameral, because for all intents and purposes, them being elected at the same time, with basically the same methods, only that the areas from which they are elected are smaller or larger, this is a redoubling of the same function, so you're paying 500 people to do the job that could be done by 300 people. So that's the issue with the bicameral system. Okay? It has to have a reason. Uh, they, they need to represent different things, right? Because if you, it's only checks and balances, then why not put three more? Or whatever, right? It's just a redoubling of things, right? So <laughs> it's not clear why it's bicameral. <laughs> anyway, both houses are directly elected, uh, um, and there was a referendum passed. People have voted to reduce the number of, of, uh, of, of houses and reduce the number of elected representatives, but it was never implemented. Anyhow, bicameral uh, elected for four years directly by the population. President is elected, used to be elected also for four years. But it changed. Why did it change? It changed because of, of the inherent problem, of the problem inherent in the system. So the president is head of state but has some head of executive attributions. 
uh, head of government of the Bishops, especially in foreign affairs, appointment of certain positions in the state, for example, members of the Constitutional Court, some policy leadership. And as always, in every political system, but especially in semi-presidential uh, uh, systems, for example, um, the power and the role of the institution is shaped by the, the, the one who occupies it. Now remember who was the, who was the leader who emerged from the 1989 events, not from the revolution, but from the events, from the TV uh, appearances in the last day of the revolution and thereafter, this person called Ion Iliescu, this sort of a former communist, right? And he became a sort of a, he self-proclaimed leader or inheritor of the revolution, I mean, which he was not, right? He was not in the, on the ground and whatever. He was just at the right time, uh, at the right place at the right time. So Ioni Iliescu becomes the first president and he will remain president and he re uh, elected out and then elected in back as president, okay? So he will shape then the position. It's an, in an interesting sh shape. First of all, clearly there will be a dominant, domination, dominance of the president over the rest. He will appoint, because uh, um, the president appoints the prime minister based on the results of elections. So basically he has to make sure that there is a... Uh, Majority, because in same presidential systems, the president can be removed both both uh, the prime minister can be removed both by the president and by through a vote of no confidence, straight vote of no confidence by the parliament, uh, right? So uh, the president needs to appoint someone uh, that has a majority. And as mentioned, there are two cases in the semi-presidential system: one of unified government and one of cohabitation. And unified, unified government is when both the majority in the parliament and the, the, when the majority in the parliament is the, constituted of the same parties from which the president comes. So basically the same parties have power here and here. And that's unified government. In that case the president can, is the boss in a way. Now if elections here produce a different majority than uh, the party from which the president is, then you have a case in which he has to appoint someone who reflects this majority. So the prime minister will come from party X, and uh, the president will come from party Y. And then, in France at least, the president kind of steps back and becomes more head of state, more ceremonial, more only foreign affairs and military, uh, rather than policy leader, and the prime minister steps forward. Now, the same thing has happened in Romania. You've had unit, unified government in which, and that was the 90s, in which the uh, majorities here were the same as uh, the majority of the president, and that was in the case of Ion Iliescu, in which case he was a strong president. A strong president, however, who was basically working behind the scenes and kind of in a, you know, let's say, you know, twisted Machiavellian way. Uh, but still, he was the leader, and it was clear that the prime ministers were at his disposal in many ways. That kind of changes, because in the 2000s you have cases of cohabitation, in which case there is a war between the Prime Minister and his majority here and the President. And that has been the history of the last, uh, I don't know, 8-10 years, okay, or, or less, about 8 years or so, of a clash between the President on the one hand and the Prime Minister and the majority on the other hand. And you see how this leads to institutional stalemate. And here's where, and here's why, the President the, the, the legislation has changed, and if the houses now are still elected every four years together, the president is elected every five years. They extended the president, used to be for four, every four and at the same time. Now it's every five years because they wanted to push, push the power towards, in a way, towards the, the president. To solve this imbalance. It has not been solved. It has not been solved still. It's still a negotiated thing. Even today there is a... Uh, um, cohabitation situation, this is until recently, uh, a few days ago, when the government changed, actually. Uh, but there is a cohabitation system, in which the president, again, plays a role, but he's limited by the situation in the parliament. If he manages to... Let me give you another example. Uh, after the elections of... Um, when was it? 2000... 2004. Or 2008. One of these. Um, we will discuss the elections in detail, but the point is here that um, uh, in the elections you had, this was at the time when both the president and the parliament was elected at the same time, in the same elections. And in the, in the parliament a certain coalition won here, and 
and their leader was on the way to be elected president. But the presidential elections happen just, just like in Poland in two rounds, and in, Czech, in the Czech Republic now in two rounds, meaning first all the candidates run, so the presidential election is everybody runs, so you have different candidates, yeah? And then, if none of these gets a majority, which is 50% plus one, then the first two who get the most votes get into a second round two weeks later, and here one of them will surely get the majority. That's also how the president in France is elected, right? So always the question is to get into the second round, to get in the first two in the first, and then get, uh, in the second, you know, win. Now, in the first round, it was the leader of the majority here, who already won the majority in the presumptive majority in the, in, the, in the parliament, the leader of this looked to be on his way to, uh, got into the first two, and got more than the, the second one, right? So let's call this majority X, right? Leader of X got more than the leader of Y in the first round. But in the second round, the leader of Y got more than the leader of X. So suddenly you have a situation of cohabitation, as I said, in which the leader of I ekes out a victory against the leader of X, who already has a sort of a majority coalition ready to be in parliament. And here's the, here's the twist. The twist is that just by virtue of getting this presidential position, and the fact that it's not one party, but a coalition of parties, including some very small ones here, by virtue of winning this, <coughs> this position, and the, by the power and prestige of his position, the pres and the fact that the president can choose whom to call to form a government, whom to, to uh, whom he can he choose whom he wants to appoint and call to form a government as prime minister, he forced the crumbling of this coalition. Because remember, it's a question of small, larger, larger, larger party. Now you take away this, you don't have a majority, and because he can, he has that leeway. When you don't have a clear majority here, the president has a leeway to force a majority by choosing someone else to form a government. And that's what happened. He managed to convince the smaller parties to switch alliance, so a different coalition Y took power. Okay. In short, just like uh, I mentioned in the case of Poland and now in Czech Republic, the position of president through this um, power of, uh, of asking, choosing whom to ask to form a government, right? Um, in countries which have a multi-party system that is fragmented with many smaller parties, he can shape, through his power of choosing, because there's no clear majority, he can shape which majority is formed, because he can choose to, to, to appoint this one or this one, and that gives a very important impetus to a specific majority being formed. Okay? So that, why did I give you this, this, this uh, you know, example? Is to show you how you know, he is head of state, but certain powers that he has as head of executive. For example, power to appoint three members from the Constitutional, Counter, uh, uh, Council, Constitutional Court. And power to appoint other things in other positions in the state, uh, the, the, the chief attorney general, and so on. So there are certain, certain key positions, right? That the president, even in times of cohabitation, can do certain important things. But it's always an interplay. And, and the essence of semi-presidential is that unless there is a clear modus operandi, uh, there can be problems. In the France, as I said, it works well because they have developed a very clear way of dealing with cohabitation. Not in Romania. Plus, the Romanian constitution is long and twisted and complicated and contradictory. So there's so many checks and balances which are in the system. Notice, right? It's just like in the U.S. Power is so separately given to the different actors in the U.S. that you have stalemate very often because the president cannot force the House to do anything, the House cannot force the Senate to do anything, the Senate cannot force the president to do anything, and they just have to work together. And sometimes they don't because they're from different parties. But that's how it was supposed to be in order to break apart power so that not only, so it's not only one actor or one group that takes all the power. And we complain of stalemate, but that's, it's in the plan, so to speak. Well, same here. They set up a very balanced system that, the benefit of balance is checks. The deficit, so to speak, of uh, the negative part of balance is immobility. The inability to, you know, 
take the reins of power and run with it. Contrary to, for example, you know, we, a parliamentary system like you know, Hungary that we discussed, where it's very clear that whoever has the majority in parliament has all the power in the executive and can go in one direction. The downside of that is that once they have the majority, they can go whichever directions, of course, within the limits of uh, you know, democracy, hopefully. Right? Uh, and that's also another question. So, that's the conundrum. So, yes, Romania has a semi-presidential system, very balanced one, uh, which recently has been plagued by, by institutional conflict, significant institutional conflict, because the tensions during the latest cohabitation went so far that the president was from party Y and the majority here in the Prime Minister from party X and very powerful personalities, that this majority tried to impeach the president several times. And impeachment, as you know, is a big thing. It used to be, it has to be treason. And they tried to impeach him for ridiculous reasons, to be honest. Uh, but in Romania, impeachment also requires a referendum, meaning the public needs to approve it. And it didn't work any of the times. So, but that just, this an attempt to impeach the president sets the whole system in, in imbalance and paralysis. And in Romania, just like in other semi-presidential systems, it's very simple. Policy is made here, is passed by both houses, and then needs to be signed by the president. So there it is. Of course, the president can veto, can be overturned with two thirds, but they don't always have two thirds. So they need each other. Yeah. So that's that's another tool of the president. So enough for uh, about uh, you know for now about this. We will look at the specific politics of Romania in the next section. But just to have a the skeleton, to have the the, the, the framework of of uh, how it is uh, set up and. Uh, the fun that emerges from that.